This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are talking with Dom Pascal Scotty about his new book, Galileo Revisited. Pascal Scotti is a priest. He's a monk in Portsmouth Abbey in uh, Rhode Island. Uh, he has a history degree from Columbia. Uh, he has a licentiate in canon law from Catholic University of America. He's contributed to a no- number of publications, academic and popular, and uh, wrote a book on the Edwardian English Catholic editor, Wilfred Ward. Uh, Father Scotty, glad to have you on the program. I'm glad to be here. So thinking as I read your book, Galileo Revisited, I suppose we have to start with sort of the, the commonplace, uh, the placeholder that Galileo and the Galileo trial holds in the Western mind as being uh, sort of the moment when or the, the symbol of the divide, uh, the irreconcilable divide between faith and reason, theology and science, the church and uh, the public realm, that you know, these things have to be kept apart because we see what happens when when religion gets too much power, it oppresses uh, good scientific men like Galileo. And yet your book, the subtitle, is The Galileo Affair in Context. What's, what's true about this popular placeholder and what's false about it? Well, Galileo certainly himself was a, a, a believer, as well as a great scientist. Um, the people around him were believers and also believers in science. Um, he's become that model because of the failures of, of the Holy See and the Curia and the Inquisition to condemn a man, um, unfortunately, and because of that one mistake, you keep on defending a mistake, and that becomes the, you know, the cause celebre that, that, that makes him the, the paragon of the martyr of science, um, which is unfortunate because he was a great believer in, 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 in science and religion both. And one of his p- purposes was to defend religion against um, a false interpretation in reference to science. So thinking about uh, the book here, is this, you know, why did you write this? Why, how did you come to be interested in this subject and, and to write on Galileo? Well, it was curiosity. I mean, it's a very, very famous case. You want to know what really happened. Uh, and of course, the more you read, the more you have to read, and it gets bigger and bigger. It began as an article a dozen, more than a dozen years ago, and then a lecture more recently, and then I've gotten this much effort into it. I might as well continue on to write a book, which is what I did. Okay. So curiosity. Curiosity. So think about Galileo. Who was Galileo? Uh, just even for our audience, dates uh, and time span, uh, his education, and um, I think later, you know, what, what motivated him? What made him uh, to have such a driving desire to press all of these points the way he did? Well, he was a Florentine uh, in, in, a, in, a, in the 16th, early, born in the middle of the 16th century, uh, in the period of the Renaissance and Catholic Reformation. I mean, people forget the Renaissance didn't end in 1517 you know, with Martin Luther or the sack of Rome later on. Uh, it perdured until the early 17th century, and he's part of that great flourishing of thought and art and culture, which is the Renaissance, uh, from not well-to-do, but from an upper-class family with the kind of uh, focus on education and culture of the upper class Florentine, born in Pisa, but he always called himself a Florentine. Pisa was part of the the rule of Tuscany by the Florentine Medici. Um, and any place he went, whether it be in Padua or Rome, he always called himself a Florentine, because um, that's a particular kind of Italian, as every part of Italy is particular to itself. Um, he was educated at the University of Pisa. Uh, never finished uh, the course there, which is not that uncommon. Um, but he had an uh, innate interest in mathematics. Uh, his father pushed him towards medicine, um, which is always a profitable thing for, for a person to study, but he became fascinated by mathematics, um, and so he pursued that on his own. But having the right connections and interests, I was able to go from, without even a degree from Pisa, to, be, to a chair at Padua, the great Renaissance University of Padua, uh, where the, his happiest years happened um, 
in the late 16th, early 17th century, as the peak period for Padua as a, as a, as a school, a universal school. Everyone from Europe, uh, well, many people from all parts of Europe went to Padua. And then uh, from Padua, he got a position with the Grand Duke of Tuscany, the Medici again, to be the philosopher uh, and mathematician to the Grand Duke, uh, which gave him freedom to write and publish in ways he really wanted to. Because if you're a teacher, you spend lots and lots of time teaching and not always the most exciting teaching. Um, so getting that position with the Medici was an enormous boon to him, both for the prestige it would give, but also for the time it could write his books. So t- talk about the Medici and Galileo, because that's obviously significant in his life and career, securing their patronage and favor. How does he do that? And um, you know, what, what, what did that mean? Well, everybody needs a patron these days. I mean, everything's by networking, by who you know, etc. That's extremely important this time period for anybody, uh, including Galileo. Um, the Medici had been a famous banking family that become the rulers, more or less, of Florence behind the scenes in the 15th century. Uh, in the 16th century, they become the actual dukes of Florence and the grand dukes of Tuscany. They become the official monarchs or rulers of, of that region of Italy. Um, uh, this, there's many branches of the Medici. This branch particularly um, uh, set its sights out high. Um, one of their members became, well, two of them altogether, the Medici became popes, two became, you know, queens of France. Uh, this particular branch of the Medici um, had restored the Medici to real power and the title of the Duke and Grand Duke. Um, they used their wealth and patronage to impress people about their insignificance. Um, and so their patronage is extremely important uh, for, for his success. He won their support by, by teaching you know, the future heir in the summers in mathematics, by having close friends uh, gain favor for him uh, with, with the Grand Duke and, and the family. And they were his main support throughout you know, most of his career. Without them, he would have really not very much because they have their own supporters in the Curia, cardinals, etc., in the Curia who support him. Uh, they have their friends and agents in other parts of Europe who give him a certain degree of prestige and status. So to be uh, the, grand, the philosopher and mathematician to the Grand Duke of Tuscany, to the Medici prince, was a major feather in his hat uh, to gain the kind of status and, and acceptance um, uh, that his science needed to be successful. So talk about, I mean, this is, this podcast is Liberty Law Talk and uh, be featured at Law and Liberty. And we, we think a lot about law, the philosophy of law, rule of law, limited government. What, if, if you're Galileo and so you've, and, and apart from his natural talent and ambition, what's, what's the story here about law, politics, government, when we think about, he's a Florentine, so from this region of Italy, uh, you know, what, is, what does he think about, or what's he learning about how one advances? How, uh, how does that happen? And, and I think we're sort of talking about it here. Well, certainly the Medici were not fans of republicanism. Um, this is no. <laughs> seized power against the republic. Um, and there were always people in other parts of Italy, you know, trying to overthrow the Medici. Uh, so you have to be very careful if you want to keep your power. Well, it's, in his case, it's not the Republican aspects of Florentine culture that he's impressed by, because everything is due to the prince. The prince's prestige, his will, his patronage is all essential. So insofar as he discussed politics, which he doesn't, uh, I guess he's a supporter of the prince. He's a, a, the patron, okay. the man who makes his life possible. What's, what's in it for the Medici to support Galileo? Is it the, the, to have the best uh, thinkers at, uh, at Padua? Is it to be seen as a seat of learning and that you're supporting that? What are they getting in this bargain? All of those things, the status. Status symbols okay. are important. Having, you know, impressive Prestige, people yeah. at your court, having a rich court, whether it be music or literature or science, to have an, a, a well-known scientist, to have a well-known artist or writer as part of your court in pre- increases your status enormously. And it's all about status. It's a very status-conscious world. Um, and the more you have, the more impressive people you have around you, the more important you are, the more respect you get. Okay. Now, you mentioned Aristotle, uh, Galileo had... Uh, was tremendously interested in mathematics, and that's noted in the book. And yet mathematics isn't the highest uh, discipline or, or uh, world of learning at the time. Uh, he also aspires to be a philosopher. Um, but that sort of brings on a question. You discussed this in the book. Uh, talk about Galileo and Aristotle, uh, Aristotle being a mentally important figure uh, 
in the Western mind, in the, in the medieval world. But maybe describe for us, how does Galileo relate to Aristotle's philosophy uh, and his metaphysics and just overall, overall, how does he perceive Aristotle and what he's doing? Well, Aristotle dominated uh, medieval learning and dominated Renaissance learning, too. I mean, he wrote about almost everything except mathematics. Um, uh, mathematics was the lowest part of the academic uh, curriculum. Uh, the worst paid professors, and very few of them, uh, were in mathematics. There's only like one professor of mathematics at Padua, one at, which is a great university, one at Pisa. It's the lowest level of, of, of the academic ladder. Um, Aristotle wrote about everything, uh, almost everything, um, and he dominated even Renaissance education to a great extent. The difficulty is um, in the natural sciences, uh, his, his dominance was becoming uh, more and more weakened uh, as certain things he described in his philosophy uh, did not match reality. Um, and so you see the beginning in the 16th century of uh, a shift away from at least some aspects of Aristotle. Um, like everyone else in, in Europe, uh, he had to study Aristotle extensively. He was always, he always saw himself certainly as an Aristotelian as far as logic and, and those disciplines go. Um, uh, it's in an area of natural philosophy we call natural science that he becomes an anti-Aristotelian. Um, but he's heavily influenced by Aristotle as everybody else is. And there's a great revival of Aristotle in the Renaissance, enormous revival in different varieties of, of, of Aristotelianism are very common. Uh, it's not one monolithic Aristotle, there are different ter interpretations and understandings of Aristotle out there. Uh, you have the great revival of scholasticism, which is very influenced by Aristotle in the 16th and early 17th century. Um, so even when he attacks Aristotle, he has a great respect for Aristotle. As he says in many of his works, you know, if Aristotle was alive today, he would be with me because he was an experimental, observational kind of person, not an ideologue. Um, he, he looked at reality, and reality no longer agrees with what Aristotle thought was true, you know, all those years before. So he, what within Aristotle would he find um, still empirically true, uh, still of use? Well, his, his, his logic, for example, okay. all of his discussion of logic would be very much Aristotle's um, Obviously, things dealing with the stars, astronomy would not be. Uh, physics, again, the physics was a big area, because even though we know um, Galileo as, as an astronomer, he really is more as a physicist. His okay. physics were really more important to him than, than astronomy. Um, and it's really a shift away in, of Aristotle and physics that, that's, for the long term, more significant for us. Um, okay. uh, and so, so it's physics and then astronomy because it doesn't relate to reality. Uh, think about another figure uh, who's being translated and discussed, Plato. Uh, right. So, so uh, Galileo and Plato, which I think matters here because of mathematics, as you write about in the book, yeah. The, the, the Middle Ages did not know Plato, except through, you know, interpretations and, and through Augustine and those people. Uh, there's no real translations of, of Plato, except for an early one, the partial translation of the Timaeus, which is about cosmology, which it would be interesting, certainly, uh, uh, Galileo. It's really in the Renaissance in the 15th century, the Ficino, particularly Ficino, Marsilio Ficino, a famous Florentine uh, philosopher, you see the massive translation of Plato and commentaries on Plato. So the great revival of Platonism in, in, in Renaissance Italy and, and also other parts is very influential. And, and science, the use of mathematics in science, I should say, is, is seen certainly by contemporary Platonists as a, a significant difference. For Aristotle, mathematics is not important. Um, for the Platonists of the 15th and 16th century, mathematics is the dividing line between Plato and Aristotle, the importance of mathematics. So, so the importance of mathematics. So Galileo is sort of, as a mathematician, he's looking for sources uh, of credibility of authority from, every... from the past that would sort of support what he's doing, none being more important perhaps than in this period, of, uh, late 16th, early 17th century, the, the revival of, of, of Greek texts. There's no doubt. Everybody looks for the past for support. Um, this idea of, of, of the future being more important than the past is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, and so everybody, even if you're being an innovator, you look for things in the past to support you because uh, you don't want to be called an innovator. There's nothing worse than being called an innovator. Um, and certainly Galileo had read a great deal of, of the past literature, uh, not just in mathematics, but obviously also in, in, in philosophy. 
Um, and so he, he doesn't want to be seen as an innovator. Um, he's influenced by lots of people of the past, but almost everybody uh, influences. He's very eclectic in his philosophy, his natural science, influenced by various sources, Stoic, uh, Aristotelian, Platonic, Epicurean with atomism, etc. cetera. Um, so there's a lot of sources of antiquity uh, that influence him. Uh, but if you had to pick one element that distinguishes him is the, the emphasis on mathematics, which is, I guess, platonic. We're seen as being platonic in the time period. So think about, because uh, I think this is all crucial uh, as we sort of get into uh, the confrontation with the church. Galileo on science, I think, but maybe even uh, Galileo's metaphysics. I mean, how does he fundamentally understand not only what we would think as uh, sort of the natural science, but uh, the relationship of of the world uh, to God um, and man's place within it? Well, certainly he's a believer. He sees creation's reflection of God's wisdom and majesty and glory and, and intelligence. Um, metaphysics, that's a very difficult question um, because he doesn't approach, he doesn't discuss these metaphysical questions, philosophical questions up front. Um, and so I, I don't know how to answer that particular question um, with any certainty, um, because certainly when you get to some of these questions, there are metaphysical points one has to mm -hmm. discuss, but he tends to eschew those, he tends to ignore those, and go right to the kind of observational realities okay. um, and other realities without probing the philosophical support for this. Um, there are certainly people who would defend his view as being Aristotelian in metaphysics, and others who would say not. It's one of those questions that's best to stay out of okay. unless you want to spend lots and lots of time doing research. Yeah. Now, the Epicurean philosophy influencing Galileo, I mean, I guess I saw that as, and maybe as you say, it, he just didn't have something fully fleshed out that he wrote about. But that, that in a way, it, that it is a metaphysics. It, it's a materialism. Um, it's, a, it's an understanding of the world and it, working in a certain way. Um, that would, you know, that that would seem to lead to a, a certain sort of understanding, perhaps, of human beings. So I, I guess that's kind of why I asked that question. He certainly an, he believes in atomism. Um, that's clear, uh, at least a variant of it. Um, he also believes in divine providence and God. So he wouldn't be your standard Epicurean by any means. Uh, he believes in divine providence. He believes in God. He believes in some created order uh, that's going someplace. Uh, but the atomism is certainly an Epicurean characteristic. Um, but there are people like Gassendi who make a Christian Epicureanism, um, which is acceptable, uh, not contrary to religion and Christianity. Um, he takes bits and pieces of, of um, various philosophies as he sees them useful or true, um, but doesn't create anything larger or systematic to do how they all fit together. Um, so he's in thinking, sense, he's you're, in a way, he's thinking what we would say very pragmatically. What he thinks very he can, pragmatic, what very he thinks pragmatically he can, yeah. focused. Um, and these are very thorny questions even today. So right. you can see why he might just get away from them and just focus on what's more doable, more observational. Um, and he's not denying, you know, the basic. Christian worldview uh, of an ordered universe. In fact, he's very much in favor of that sort of worldview. Um, but he's not discussing the metaphysics of how it all is put together. Okay. So we would say he is pursuing something like the scientific method. That's... Yes. I mean, people define it differently, but I think, yes, he's, he's pursuing a method that will get him a certain degree of knowledge about reality that also reflects a divine order. Okay. Um, so let's think about then, so as, as I, I listen to you say this, and I was thinking about this in the book, okay, um, no real need for a confrontation uh, with the church uh, on these questions. So maybe switching gears here and just thinking about the Vatican, the seat of power uh, at this time, and so early 17th century, um, you have a wonderful discussion of the sort of succession of popes, uh, safe to say many of them uh, with the pursuit of holiness or being the servant of the servants of God, not the highest thing on their list, uh, as, as we think about them. Um, the Pope, though, who will sit during the trial and sort of be a part of the persecution of Galileo, uh, who was he? What was he about? And also there's Cardinal Bellarmine is also an important figure here as well. Maybe talk about sort of their, uh, his, his contribution also to the Galileo trial. <laughs> 
Well, um, Bellarmine was a famous Jesuit uh, theologian, teacher, uh, the most significant theologian of the Catholic Reformation, certainly. Uh, he was named a cardinal, uh, served in various capacities, including on the Inquisition. Um, he was a kind of intellectual sta- standard bearer for the Jesuits and, 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 and the Roman Curia. Uh, g- enormous respect uh, given him, both because of his holiness and his intelligence. Again, it was often common those days to be very, you know, nasty and vicious in your in polemic and your discussion. He was always very respectful uh, and very non. Um, I'm looking for not offensive, okay. uh, not scurrilous in his in his writings, etc. It was very common in the 16th century to be so. Um, but he's also a man of his time, um, man of you know the limitations of his time. His whole life is given to you know zealously proclaiming the Catholic faith, and and for him you know newness, innovation is certainly dangerous and heretical even. Uh, and so anything new is going to be somewhat questionable in in his mindset. Plus, by the time Galileo shows up, he's rather in his old age, uh, and his most fruitful years are in the past. Um, so he is... Be- Bellarmine's fruitful oh, years. This is Bellarmine. So he, okay. he's critical, but he's accepting, uh, for the most part, what Galileo has to say, but he's very doubtful about certain points and does not want to see those points pressed further without certainty. And the problem with Galileo is, is that he never can have the certainty and proof he needs to support his propositions about the earth and the sun and so forth. Um, those okay. will come for many, many, many years now, later. Now, you mentioned anything about Bellarmine. You mentioned uh, Catholic Counter-Reformation. That, that's also a part of this uh, situation. Right. You had the Reformation well, yeah. beginning in the early 16th century. And so the church is actually in a period of great uh, conflict, and, and, and there's a great defensiveness, aggressiveness even, uh, to regain uh, the, the faith and regain parts of Europe for the faith. And so things that might have been passed easily before uh, aren't being passed easily now. It's much more controlling, more defensive, uh, more traditionalist in many respects, uh, less open to new ideas, um, unless you can prove them, which Galileo couldn't do, unfortunately, at least not at that time. Um, and so it's a different mindset, a different world than, say, the papacy of Leo X, you know, where something like this probably would have gone and been okay. It would have been passed more or less as another interesting thing in a very interesting world. Um, but in the period of the Catholic Reformation, you know, innovation is, is dangerous, and here is innovation. Um, that being said, Galileo was, was, was a highly respected figure. He was feted at the Roman College, the Jesuit University in Rome, uh, friends of popes, including the pope who would eventually persecute him. Urban VIII, the man who would be the great enemy in the end of Galileo, was his personal friend, also a Florentine, a great promoter of Galileo uh, through most of his career. He got permission, uh, to, um, Galileo got permission from Urban to write the book, he was eventually condemned for the dialogue in the two chief world systems. Um, And so a lot of personal issues are part of this, as well as the time period of of conflict and defensiveness. Um, And the case of Pope Urban, um, a very touchy man, um, the sense of personal betrayal, the sense of personal insult, uh, the loss of status because of personal insult, all these things are important in the trial itself. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I want to I want to pick up on something because you you make this comparison in the book. You say the mind of Catholicism that was able to receive Aristotle uh, and all of his, uh, you know, not exactly tight fit with a with a Catholic worldview. Uh, that same mind could not incorporate Galileo and his. Uh, triumphing of the Copernican system, and yeah. and, you're, and I guess you're sort of we we're talking about why that is, um, and and this is so, so there's this context, there's this situation here, um, but what were I mean because I, I take it, um, so we're in this moment. Um, ultimately, though, what's what is it about Galileo that sort of drives his friend Pope Urban the Eighth? I mean, what are the precise issues that you know, lead to an actual trial? Um. Well, Galileo was never a man to underestimate his intelligence and, and verbal rhetorical ability. And so he always pressed his points aggressively, uh, sometimes too aggressively, many people would say, which often offended people. Um, and though he'd been the personal friend of, of Pope Urban VIII, um, and he'd gotten permission from Urban VIII uh, to write this book. Um, what was the book? 
The book was the dialogue in the two chief world systems, a book of cosmology, actually defending the 1616 decision of the Inquisition. The, the, okay. In 1616, Galileo, well, Galileo was condemned without mentioning him. Um, Copernicus was condemned um, by the Inquisition as the opinions being contrary to sacred scripture. What had happened the year before, Galileo had gone to Rome very aggressively, pushing his cause, pushing uh, Copernicanism and its, and its, and its, and its positions. Um, and by the very process of doing that, I think it led to the opposite reaction of a condemnation. But he was never mentioned in the condemnation. Um, in fact, he was treated very well in Rome uh, and, and not mentioned in, in the condemnation. But um, was, kind of, uh, was basically given a pretty stern warning. He was going to so, warning, something like in baseball, uh, you would call it a brushback pitch, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right. And 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 so that warning was there in the records, and Galileo had a copy of of a warning, um, which is not the exact same copy of the Inquisition had in their records. It seems later on, um, and so you couldn't publicly defend Copernicus um, after 1616. Um, so Galileo got permission from the Pope Urban VIII, who defended him in 1616. It's 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 likely that Urban uh, that then Cardinal Barberini, who becomes Pope Urban, was a major factor while Galileo was not condemned in 1616, nor was Copernicanism seen as being heretical. Um, and, and that's kind of interesting. So it, it, Barberini himself, who becomes Pope Urban, is, is, is open to new ideas, He's at least more so. He's a friend of Galileo. He gets permission, um, Galileo gets permission to write this book, which is supposed to defend the 1616 decision, um, but to give it further weight, it's going to be discussion, a dialogue back and forth on these issues. But if you read the dialogue, though officially it's anti, anti Copernicus, the weight of the discussion really is pro Copernicus. Uh, and so if you were reading this book, you would say that's what he's trying to say, though he can't say that officially and says the opposite officially. But the whole weight of the arguments in the book itself are more in favor of Copernicus than really against Copernicus. And the, and the voice of Aristotle in the dialogue is the simpleton. And he, and, and as you write about, um, this is kind of held towards the end, and it's really the view of the Pope. And so this, this drives Pope Urban VIII crazy because he's, he's ridiculed. He's ridiculed. I mean, Aristotle is the, the figure who is the Aristotelian in, in the dialogue, there are three characters, is stupid. He's stupid and incompetent. He's a stupid Aristotelian. Um, and so he makes Aristotle look worse than he, than he does and should be shown. Um, there's a polemical reason for all of this, obviously, on Galileo's part. And the argument that Pope Urban demanded, demanded that Galileo put into the dialogue about God's omnipotent power being such, he could always do something, you know, different than we expect. Um, he, he had to put that into the dialogue, but the only person he could put into really with any sort of intelligence and, and, and fittingness is the character who's the stupid Aristotelian. Uh, and so you had the stupid person in the dialogue using the argument of the Pope, but that the Pope forced him to put in the book, uh, it, it, and this is very embarrassing to the Pope, very insulting to the Pope. Um, I can only guess that Galileo thought he could finesse this, um, using his own personal knowledge, his friendship, etc., as a way of, of bridging this reality. But you know, many people were very many people would see this as an insult against the Pope. I think. So, oh, th thinking about um, getting into sort of this confrontation. Is Galileo the only one behind Galileo, or are there other forces supporting him in this sort of need to press all of these points uh, in the way that he does, which he's, he's aggressive about it? Yeah. Well, the Jesuits were certainly the great supporters of Galileo through most of his career, because they're the ones who are more cutting edge. They're the ones who see the deficiencies of Aristotle and the natural sciences. They're the ones who want to be the best and the brightest and the most accurate. And they're the great scholars of the Catholic faith in the 16th and 17th century, for sure. Um, but their method is not to be very public and aggressive, because that often doesn't work well. And so you have the Roman scientists, the, the Roman college scientists, people that judge with the Roman college, who are very important, you know, in the scholarly world. They're trying to change the views of science in the world, you know, more slowly, more carefully, without a blowback from authority uh, as these new ideas become more common. Um, and so they were certainly a great support of Galileo through most of his career, but they were very put off by his aggressiveness. They were put off by his anti he became very anti-Jesuit and very petty about it also, even publicly so, which also put the Jesuits off. 
Um, and so when he goes from in 1632 for this, this great trial, 1632-33, for this great trial, you don't have the support of the Jesuits there. They're, they're neutral. They're not involved really in any way back for or against him. Um, but they would have been people who could have been supporters of him had he not pushed them away by his own behavior, by his own aggressiveness, and by his own pettiness, actually. So thinking about uh, Isaiah Berlin, uh, this is famous distinction of uh, kinds of thinkers, uh, either a hedgehog or a fox, what, what would you say Galileo is? is or, or is he some sort of combination? Uh, no, the hedgehog being someone who knows one big thing or a fox. Yeah, you think he's a fox. Okay. Now, why, why do you say that? Okay, sorry. Would you say that again, please? Oh, no, I was just sort of, for our listeners, just explaining the distinction between the hedgehog and the fox. Uh, but, the, but the fox knows many things uh, and is also adept, usually, adept at, at promoting them. Uh, now, I would, I would think Galileo is more of a hedgehog. Why do you say he's a fox? Yes, I, I, I was confused for a second. I'm sorry. My apologies. Okay. Um, I agree with you. He is a hedgehog. He okay. has an idea. Once he has an idea in his head, he can't put it down. He can't stop. And it's a big idea. And it dominates, you know, everything. Uh, so, so everything you, you he's be doing. Correct. Okay. He dominates everything he's doing. But because in a way, he's not very adept, as we've been hitting at, in ways in which one might advance. Uh, a controversial set of ideas or a set of ideas that challenge uh, sort of a ruling uh, established order, uh, seems to me. He certainly, you know, he, he's, he's, he very much is, in, is pushing for, you know, these ideas, even when he's warned repeatedly that this is going to blow back and it's going to be worse off for doing so. The Jesuits repeatedly warned him, you know, work out your science, find the evidence you need, uh, the support you need. Don't push these issues until you need to. Uh, and he always ignored their advice, um, which is why he lost their support. So we're in the papal states. Uh, we're in uh, the papal state uh, for this trial. We're in the Vatican. Uh, what, what happens? Uh, why, why do we get to a trial? Why does Galileo not flee? Uh, he seems to want this. What's, what's really driving uh, this as we, as we get into a, 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 you know, a contest here of, of, of law and of wills? Well, he had I mean, the censors had approved the book. I mean, the book had been approved by all the official censors, who so had all the official permissions um, to have it published, etc. Uh, and it's not uncommon still, to have when you book, say book. Is this the dialogue? The dialogue, yes, I'm okay. sorry. Um, it had all the official permissions be approved, uh, been read by theologians in Rome and in Florence both. Um, and so it had all the official permissions. It's not uncommon for books to get condemned by the Inquisition. It's not as uncommon as you might think. Um, and different degrees of, of being penalized. Um, there's no way he could not deal with this uh, and keep his position, keep his status, keep his influence, because if, if he was, you know, a person who fled from the Inquisition, fled to flee from Italy, really, to do that, I mean, his credibility would be shattered in the Catholic world completely. Um, and, and, and so he really had to go to Rome, uh, despite his desire not to go to Rome. He was an old man. He was sick. Uh, not in the best of health. Uh, so he had to go to Rome. He could have expected a different result. At some point, I think he really did expect a very different result, uh, a much more gentle, mild uh, uh, result. Uh, and I think the, the very harsh result he got was far more than he expected and far more than many other people expected, because um, obviously the Medici are doing their best to support him in Rome with their agents, their supporters, the Curia, uh, their influence with the cardinals and, and, and the Pope and other people in the Curia. Uh, and many others also. Um, why, why do you think the Vatican uh, that opposes Galileo, what do they see uh, what, what do they see as most at stake here? It's really down to Pope Urban, I think. Um, okay. uh, his pre I mean, whatever he wanted would have been done, uh, because his faction dominates the Inquisition, certainly. It dominates the Curia. He appointed lots and lots of cardinals. So everybody, uh, lots of people owed him that kind of loyalty. And that's how factions work. I mean, you were made a cardinal or other positions, and you owe loyalty to the person that made you. Uh, and so if Urban had said, you know, do nothing to him, nothing would have been done. Because Urban wanted to punish him, Urban wanted him to be condemned, to humiliate him even, uh, that happened the way it did. Um, but what of, of Galileo's arguments uh, regarding science? I mean, what is... What is said to be the th the things that cannot be allowed or that are condemned, and why? 
Well, it comes back under the Holy Scripture. Again, again, Scripture seems to be saying in a number of places that the, um, the earth is stationary and the sun moves. Uh, and so in the time of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, to say that Scripture was wrong is not a thing that you can do easily. Uh, so that made it far more significant than it would have been perhaps earlier on. Um, but now that's interesting because even in mean, my limited knowledge, but you go back to Augustine or Aquinas, there's the five senses of Scripture. Certainly one does not reduce all Scripture to a literal interpretation, they would, they would argue. And so, but is, is the Vatican doing that? I mean, that seems sort of ridiculous. Well, I mean, even before this condemnation, um, it would have been difficult. It, it would have been, I mean, the, script, the dominance of Scripture, even the earlier period, would be pretty strong, whether it be Augustine, Aquinas, etc. So all of these people would, would hold that certain parts of Scripture, you know, should be held in, 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 a, in a literal sense. Um, and it was seen as so. So even the high Middle Ages, though some people criticized and thought, you know, other views of the cosmos you know, more likely, because Scripture said this, or seemed to say this, they they did not push it further. Um, So that's an old, old reality of the Church is continuing in the 16th century. Um, On the whole, they held Scripture far more literally, um, at least least in some areas, not not in every area, obviously, uh, than we would today. Um, Okay. So that, that view of Scripture is significant, but it's not... Again, it's, it's not per se heret- heretical. So when in 1616, Galileo, well, Copernicus is condemned as being contrary to Scripture, um, it, it's not the same, the same that he's a heretic, um, okay. which is far more radical condemnation. I remember Galileo, sorry, Copernicus had, had dedicated the book to, pope, uh, to the Pope of his time period, uh, Pope Paul III. Uh, he was a Catholic canon. He had many patrons and friends in the hierarchy in the Curia. Uh, it was not seen as being dangerous or as dangerous in an earlier period of time. But I think the Reformation changes that dynamic. Uh, and okay. so more literal reading of Scripture becomes more dominant uh, than it was before. Um, it, these ideas become more dangerous because they are contrary to Scripture than they were before. Uh, things are less flexible than they used to be before the Reformation happened. Um, and so it's, it's more difficult to, to defend a, a new interpretation of Scripture, but that many did. I mean, if, if, as, as the book makes clear, the number of theologians that discussed how Scripture could be read um, in reference to Copernicus and Galileo, and it would be fine. Um, and many people said, if you don't read it this way, you set the church up for, for failure for the future. Um, which okay. could to be the, the, the truth. So think, thinking about this, I mean, I, one of the reasons why I was interested in your book and this discussion, when I was practicing law, I went to a continuing legal education seminar on the trial. And there's was a professor from Oxford, historian, raised just a very a practical question that none of us had considered, which is, you're Galileo, how do you prove this? Because you have to prove it. And none of this is self-evident. Uh, none of this is certainly evident, uh, really, from mainstream science of that period. So what what proof is Galileo able to offer that the Earth moves around the Sun? Well, the trial isn't really about that topic. That had been decided in 1616. Um, the topic is really, did he act against the decision of 1616? Did he act against the injunction he was given by Cardinal Bellarmine? It's really a legal discussion, not a scientific one. The scientific one was, was decided in 1616 uh, at that first you know, okay. decision of the Holy Office. Um, this is really about, did he break the injunction? Did he go against the decision of 1616? It's a purely legal, canonical kind of discussion, not scientific at all. Okay. So we're thinking about the scientific question, which is obviously underneath all of this. Uh, right. what's, what's his evidence? What is Galileo's well, evidence? Well, he, he thought the best evidence, which is completely false, as we now know, okay. is the tides, okay. movement of the tides. Um, no one could have proved you know, what he was trying to prove in the 16th century and the 17th century, uh, really until the 18th century, uh, and a bit later even in some respects. So he couldn't have proved his point um, and the point he thought was the strongest in his favor, that the, the movement of the tides is actually wrong. So it's, it's a base of, 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 of probabilities, of guesses. Um, he was in a difficult position because the science was not there to support him um, and would not be for a very long time. So uh, Galileo is judged guilty for breaking the 1616 decree. And the injunction and, and so on. And what, so what's uh, because, the aftermath for him? What happens to him? 
Well, he's under house arrest uh, first in Rome at the the Florentine um, embassy there, then house arrest with a cardinal in Tuscany, who's a friend of his, then house arrest um, at his place in Tuscany, is his villa, uh, and he remains under house arrest until he dies. Um, which which is not horrible, but it's not great either because he's, what is he's the, so What does house arrest mean? I mean, how, I guess you know we would enforce that now, obviously with ankle bracelets. But how? Well, it's it's, it's in some <laughs> respects it's similar to that. So when he was with the car, the the archbishop in Siena, it was fine. A lot of people come and go, and so on and so forth. And he revived a great deal um, when he's when he had house arrest in his home, his home, his villa. Uh, and, 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 and outside of Florence, you know, the number of people who could see him was limited. Uh, his travel was very limited. He could only go for, you know, very particular um, circumstances. So he was restrained enormously about who he could see and who could see him, um, uh, which is, you know, he's not being tortured. He was never tortured. He was never really imp- never imprisoned even. Even when he was on trial of the Inquisition, he stayed in the apartments of, of the Inquisitor, the member of the Inquisition there. Um, so he's always treated extremely well. Um, so he's never imprisoned or tortured or those sorts of things. But he was severely limited in what he could, what he could do, what, who, could, who could see him, where he could travel. Um, it's also, I guess, just that public judgment of isolation. Yeah. It, 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 and a lot of it's punitive. There's no doubt um, many people thought it was very punitive, excessive. Uh, many people tried to get the Pope to, to, to change his mind. Um, but Pope Urban was the kind of person, once he was angry and it decided what was going to happen, it wasn't going to change. He had that kind of personality. Either he were his friend or his enemy. And Galileo went from being a friend to an enemy. So your, your judgment on the church here, on what they did uh, to Galileo on finding him guilty of breaking the 1616 judgment, his punishment, and I suppose the entire way they proceeded with him. Your, your thoughts here? It didn't have to happen. Um, had the personality been somewhat different, uh, it wouldn't have happened. Um, no one has done more for science uh, than the Catholic Church throughout the history of, of, of science. Uh, you, you can see whole books on this topic. Um, but this one event uh, sets the stage for the conflict thesis uh, of religion versus science. Um, and once you make a mistake like this, and the Holy See makes a mistake like this, they never want to admit they made a mistake. And so you have to keep on defending the mistake, uh, in, even to the modern period. Um, so you're you know, saying, it's unfortunate. So in the, in the aftermath, um, I mean, successive popes, do they revisit the issue? Do they try to ignore it? Uh, what happens? Well, in the 18th century, the middle 18th century, uh, another pope, uh, Pope Benedict the... I was got the fourteenth, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, he removed uh, from the index of forbidden books. Uh, you could publish books supporting Copernicanism, okay. but he kept on the index the books, the Galileo's book and Copernicus, etc., um, with corrections for the Copernicus's book, but some very minor corrections. Um, and so, even though you could write now supporting these theories, um, Galileo himself was still on the index. Uh, and then in the early 19th century, he was removed from the index, as well as these other people who had supported Copernicus, um, Fuscarini, and so forth, uh, were also removed from the index uh, in the early 19th, early eight, yeah, 19th century. Um, and then more recently, uh, under Pope John Paul II, there was an investigation that removed some of the you know, confusion and admitted some degree of error, uh, but never fully so. Um, and that's really where it stands. I mean, a lot of people have resistance. You no, know, I, I guess that's interesting. Let's talk about that, because I have been under the impression that John Paul II issued sort of a full apology for the entire thing. And that's what um, most people think, because the headlines okay. seem to say in the newspapers. Yeah. But it was not a complete you know, admission of guilt by the people who really caused the most difficulties. Um, and, and, and so it was a more ambiguous apology and, 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 and so, so forth. So what, what, what was, what, talk about the details on that. That's interesting. Well, this whole article was written about this very topic. Um, you can find, I'm sure, if you look. Um, I think part of it, there's always a resistance to any bureaucracy to admit mistakes, uh, even when they're so obvious ones. Yeah. So you find a way of downplaying this or downplaying that or saying, well, what about this and what about that, making it a bit more ambiguous. Um, I think that 
resistance to bureaucracies, to having a complete admission of error is what happened in the end, um, uh, which is unfortunate. Now, you, you talk about in your last chapter, a letter from Pope Benedict XVI, uh, and, and we didn't talk about this, and I wanted to touch on this briefly about Pope Urban VIII. Um, Pope Benedict XVI in this letter, if I remember, the Vatican was wrong uh, at the time in its conception of God. Uh, and God's God in his relationship to creation, and it was, and you quote uh, sort of a letter from Pope Urban VIII, uh, a nominalist, voluntaristic God, uh, one that I would associate more with John Calvin, or even Islamic theology rather than the one that you would, I thought, sort of came out of the medieval period with Aquinas, um, and you know, sort of that God could create however He wanted to, uh, as long as He didn't contradict Himself. Uh, therefore, that made. Galileo's project even more uh, uh, unsure uh, because of his, his reliance on some sort of predictability of nature. And Pope Benedict XVI says Galileo in this letter uh, understood science and he may have understood God better. And I uh, talk about that because I thought that was interesting. Well, this, 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 ever since the 13th century and the condemnation of 1277 of various propositions, you know, at the universities, there's been this fear of limiting God, of forcing necessity on God, of limiting God, basically, um, to natural categories and, and, and ways of thinking. And it has a plus side and a negative side. The plus side is it makes you more free to look at other options, other theories. The negative side does encourage a certain skepticism towards reason and, 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 and the world. Um, and you have the rise of nominalism, and this is, this is a massive topic that many people mm -hmm. spend many books on. Um, but you see a greater degree of skepticism towards the natural world, and a greater emphasis on faith, therefore, and yes. revelation as part of this as, 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 as part of this reality. Um, and that perdures really uh, beyond uh, the 13th and 14th, 15th, 16th century. And again, you have the same in the 16th century and early 17th century. This whole controversy on grace and freedom. Um, which touched a lot of the same issues about, you know, limiting God's power, forcing necessity on God, etc. And, and some people believe that one of the origins, of, at least of Pope Urban's kind of skepticism, is, is this conflict and discussion over grace and freedom that was very intense uh, between the Dominicans and Jesuits uh, in the 16th and early 17th century. Um, because you don't want to box God in and force say God has to do this, or it seems you're limiting God's you know true majesty. Um, but a lot of people, many scholars were voluntarists or more in that direction. Uh, Urban was not the only one who was inclined in that direction. It was a very common idea uh, among, among certain, even scientists, some of them. Um, so it's if taken to an extreme, it's I think highly dangerous. Um, the, the, the difficulty is where do you stop? You want to keep God's sovereignty and freedom. Um, but you don't want to denigrate man's capacities and reason and, and his capacity to understand reality, which is also a God-given gift. Yeah, I mean, as I, I mean, as, as I read Pope Benedict XVI's letter, it all, your book, the controversy, the condemnation of Galileo, the struggle with science, it all started to come together for me. And and in, in the way, I, and correct me, but and maybe I'm just I'm being too conclusory here. But it's it's almost as if to say, uh, leading theologians, uh, including uh, how their effect on the Pope, then Pope Urban the Eighth, uh, basically had a, a a fideistic understanding of God, and this corrupted their thinking of science. And the reason why that mattered to me oh, is sort of the reading I've done on Islam is. Uh, many have articulated this is why Islam has such a difficulty with science because of its uh, fideistic, nominalistic understanding of God, and um, God could create the world however He wanted, uh, and so it doesn't really have the predictability and regularity and mind and reason to it that you need if you're going to engage in scientific pursuit and study. And so it all, in a, in a way, it's just like this is so. This, the, my conclusion is this is also unfortunate. Uh, so much confusion. Well, I think that that's certainly true. The, the difficulty is to make God God, you have to give him, you know, absolute power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, and you don't want to limit God and his power and so forth. And so the difficulty is how to reconcile mm -hmm. human limitedness, which is certainly true. I mean, we're not, we're not all-knowing, can't be all-knowing. But yet we're given this enormous power by God to, to look at reality, to know reality, see God in reality. I mean, the world itself is, is a word from God. 
Uh, and that's how Christianity is different significantly than Islam. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, there's many discussions here one could have of different philosophers in Islam, etc., on this topic. But it's, it's the belief in reason, the belief in the ordered cosmos um, is it, so significant part of so much of Christian history. Um, and to fall into, into this kind of fideism uh, is, 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 I think, a very dangerous yeah. um, um, consequence. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, well, I thought you were Aquinas and the way he dealt with the analogy of being, uh, and to the to to deal with sort of this problem of I uh, you know I don't want to be telling God what He has to do because of reason, uh, but yet that's sort of my approximation of what He's done it happens by way of analogy, uh, which is uh, sort of a way I can come to know both the reasonableness of creation but also the reasonableness of God. Mm-hmm. No, there's no doubt about it. The Galileo believes that the world reflects God and his goodness, his wisdom, his knowledge, his majesty, and to and to attack reason in any sense is yeah. to attack God. Yeah. Um, well, Father uh, Scotty, thank you uh, for this discussion uh, that we've well, been thank having you very much. On, on the Galileo Affair. Your book, Galileo Revisited. Um, I hope it gets a, a lot of discussion and attention, um, uh, and, and thank you so much for your work and for the interview today. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. This is your host, Richard Greinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.